Okay. So, um, so this week's parsha is parsha Bahalotacha. and um, you know, we, as I said a couple weeks ago, when we started looking at the book of Amidbar, you'd expected us to start the stories, and we hadn't really. Finally, now the Bnei Israel, the children of Israel, start traveling in the wilderness. Now, for nearly a year, they've been at Mount Sinai because God spoke to people at the divine revelation. They built the Mishkan and they were given the laws. And now, at what should be the apex of the children of Israel's relationship with God, because they, they've been learned, they learned had laws of how to live with God always, everywhere. And we'd expect, you know, that Sinai. Revelation was the wedding. You know, the past year was the honeymoon. We talk about, um, in marriage, we talk about Shana Rishona. The first year of a marriage, there are certain laws which people like to keep um, that have heard, anyone's heard about this, that during the first year of marriage, uh, the husband uh, shouldn't go away on business, and if he should, then maybe the wife should come with. In other words, the first year should be a, a year of really getting to know each other and really spending the full time together uh, with each other. And the very first thing the people do when they start to move, finally, after this honeymoon period, is they complain. And we've had the children of Israel complaining before, but they're complaining here about the man. And what's interesting is, this is not the first time they've complained about the man, because we've seen them, and we're going to be comparing and contrasting their, complain, their complaints about the man. They complain about the man, or the lack of food, and giving the man um, already in the book of Exodus. So... So the question is, did they suddenly forget that they were so close with God that they just had this amazing, intense experience of Sinai, the revelation, the building of the Mishkan, etc., the induction of the Mishkan? And it's, it's difficult when you get to this part of the Torah because it, it, you struggle because it's hard to relate. You read these stories in the Torah and we feel that, that the children of Israel fell into a trap because, uh, you know, they, they fell into this trap of complaining and we fall into the trap of judging them for complaining. We think, you know, if I was around then, I would never have done this, you know? But the Torah isn't a history book. And it certainly isn't an ancient history book. And it has lessons for us for all times. So whether you lived the time of the Torah, whether you lived the time of King David, the temple, or whether you, you live now, in, you know, in 2021 here in the UK, it's got to be relatable to us. So how can we understand? How can we relate to what really seems to be a very ungrateful, chutzpahdik nation? So in chapter 11, verses 4 to 6, the children of Israel are complaining. If only we had meat. We remember all the fish that we ate in Egypt for free. And now our souls are dried out. We have nothing except for the man. I mean, that's what they're complaining about. So what does God do? God gives them quail. So the people are about to travel and they complain about the food. Does that remind us of anything? As we said, this happens exactly in the book of Shemot, in the book of Exodus, when the children of Israel arrive in the desert. And despite their terrible, horrific experiences of slavery for, according to most, 200 and something years, and despite having God just having rescued them, they complain. If you look almost exactly the same, verse 16 in, in Exodus chapter 3, sorry, sorry, chapter 16, verse 3, you brought us to the desert to die of hunger. So both stories take place at the beginning of children of Israel's travels in the desert, right? In the Exodus, they were traveling from the uh, Yam Suf, from the Sea of Reed. And here in um, Bamidbar, they're traveling from Mount Sinai. And straight away, they're complaining about food. And there's another similarity, because back in Shemot, God gives the people the manna to uh, quell their hunger, but he also gives them something else. In chapter 16, verse 13, it says, Vayiba Erev, and at night the quails came and covered the camp. So those two same foods are used. And they're the focus also here in Bamidbar. And at some point after the story of Shemot, after the story in Bishalach, where this happens, it must be that the quail stops. 
the mana continues, but the quail stops. And here in uh, chapter 11, verse 31, um, now the people complain that all they have is man. And, and in the response to that, it says, The wind brought the, the quails forth, and uh, they fell by the camp. So, again, mana, quail. But these similarities don't just end there. There's other connections. Because not only is the content of the complaints similar, but they both follow the same structural formula. So, we go back to uh, chapter 16, verse 3. What do they say? If only we had died in Egypt. Okay, that's one thing. Then they reminisce about how good it was in Egypt. We sat over the pots of meat and we were satiated with bread. It sounds all great. And then it says, you brought us to the desert only to die of hunger. So we have these elements. We have, if only, if only we had died in Egypt. Then they're reminiscing about the wonderful time they had in Egypt, how we sat by the pots of meat. And then there's a description about how difficult their, their current situation is. That's how they're talking about um, back in Shemot. And if you now look here in um, Babidbar chapter 11, verses 5 to 6, Mi achilenu basar, if only we had meat, then they say, again. We remember the uh, fish that we ate and the cucumbers and the watermelons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. But now our souls are dried out. We have nothing except for the mana. So it's exactly the same thing. It's talking about if only. Then it's talking about how amazing things were in Egypt. And then it's talking about how terrible things are in the current situation. So those are the similarities between these two episodes. But there are also, interestingly, some major differences. Because when you think about it, in Shemot, in Exodus, just after uh, crossing the sea, they actually have no food. They're scared that they're going to die of starvation. But now, in the book of Bamidbar, when they're traveling from Har Sinai, that's not true. They have food. They have the man. In fact, they've had the man since the uh, exodus. And yet they're complaining as if the situation is exactly the same. We're dried out. In cold, we have nothing built except for this man. And look at how God responds to the two complaints. In exodus, God seems to understand the people. And he's, you know, he says, okay, you're hungry, here's food. He simply supplies them with what they're asking for. But God's reaction here in Bamidbar is very different. Vayichar Af Hashem, chapter 11, uh, verse 10. God was enraged. Right? And Moses was distressed. And then it says in 31, which is the source above, God struck the people with an extremely severe uh, blow, striking. So what's going on here? Why do the people complain about food again, even though they actually had food? And why does God react so differently to their complaint? So the key may be in one last difference between these two stories. Because in Shemot, after the people complain to Moses. And chapter 16, verses 11 to 12, what does it say there? What is Shamati et Tulunot b'nei Yisrael. This is in Shemos chapter 16. Exodus chapter 16, verses 11 and 12. You got it up there? Do you have it up there? Maybe it's down. No, it's down, I think, maybe. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so look at look here. I've heard the complaints of the Bnei Yisrael. Tell them at night, they'll eat meat, and in the morning, bread, and they will know that I am God. So what does this mean, they'll know <laughs> that I am God? I mean, how could they not know that Hashem is God? What, what is Hashem saying here? So in Bajra B'Shalach, after God took the Bnei Yisrael, children of Israel, out of Egypt, 
they doubted whether Hashem was with them, whether he would provide for them in the wilderness. And while the people perhaps should have believed, it seemed that Hashem understood the skepticism. After all, although he did save them, it really was all through destruction because God had destroyed the children, the, the uh, Egyptians with the plagues. And then he completely annihilated the army and the sea. So yes, God is powerful. That was no question. Is God capable of doing anything he wants? Yes. But is he a loving God? That's the question that's being asked. They had no idea yet that God was a loving God. So Hashem says, you know what? You're right. And I'll show you. I'll show you that I'm with you. I'll show you that I love you. And what I'll do is I'll provide for you. I will tenderly give you food. And uh, I'll give you mana. I'll give you quail. And then I'll be with you at Mount Sinai. And we'll spend the year getting to know each other. That Shana Rishona. And that, that's really the difference there. But now we're in Bamidbar. And it didn't work. Because the children of Israel, for some reason, still doubt. How is that possible? So maybe there's something deeper here, which is suggested. Maybe it was never really about their emunah, their faith in God. Maybe it was about something else. Maybe it was something that was masked in an issue of faith. And if that's the case, perhaps whatever the real issue is, continues even here into the book of Bamidbar. Because we think that the ultimate answer lies in the details of the first story of the mana. When Hashem provided the mana, it was given with two restrictions. Anyone remember the two restrictions given? I don't have them here on the source sheet. Anyone remember the first, the, the, the first mana story? There were two restrictions about it. So when they wanted to take the manna, they could take only the amount that they needed for one day. That was all they were allowed to do. And there was another thing. They would collect double on Friday. And they would not collect at all on Shabbat, which I suppose is a third thing, but that sort of goes together. So each day they were allowed to collect what they needed. And in fact, if they tried to collect more than they needed, it would go off. It would go rotten. And again, this is purely based on faith. The fact that you're going to have faith in God, that, he, that every morning, you're, you know, it's like someone nowadays, I suppose, thinking to themselves, I've got my food for today, and tomorrow morning, I open my cupboard, and it's going to be replenished with the food I need for tomorrow. That's a huge, you know, that's a huge ask for people. But th that's what God asked them, to take enough food for one day, and on Shabbat, to take double, which is, of course, why on Shabbat we have two loaves of challah on the on the table, it's to represent the Lechem Mishnah. It represents the two loaves, which were presented on a Friday, which the children of Israel, as it were, took the two loaves of manna on, on, uh, on Friday. Which, by the way, also, this idea of um, putting seeds on our challah, although it's a little nice and tasty, and some people like uh, puppy seeds, and some people like sesame seeds, some people like it seedless, but actually that also is based on the verse in, um, in Exodus, where it talks about the mana being Kizra God. It, it, it talks about it being like, like, a, like a seed. Let me get the exact translation. Um, uh, very quickly. It's worth having a look at. Here we are. Yeah. So it says here, Moses said, this is the thing that Hashem has commanded, a full Omer. Um, chapter 20, 30, verse, sorry, 31. The house of Israel called it manna. It was like coriander seed. So it talks about a seed. It was white and it tasted like a cake fried in honey. Okay, which I know sounds quite nice, maybe a bit fattening, but certainly tasted quite nice. Um, and there, there you go. So it, it talks about seed, and that's where we get this idea of the seeds for the challah, which we have for Shabbat, being uh, covered, and also why we have double. So that was the that was the rules that you have to get as much as you need for today, 
And on Friday, you take double for Shabbat, but not collect on Shabbat. Why? What is Hashem trying to tell us by restricting us in this way? So, you know, if you've just been released from Egypt with all the amazing wonders, which you saw the, uh, the plagues, the splitting of the sea, and now you're in the desert, and God says, I know you don't have anything, but don't worry, I'll take care of you. It's nice, but it's also very scary to hear that because you have absolutely no control. We said, forget about going to a shop to buy, you know, your shopping. You cannot produce anything. There's nowhere to plant. There's nowhere to harvest. You're in the middle of a desert. You're completely in the hands of God. And human beings, we desire control. Because in our minds, control is security. Right? We want physical security. So we set up systems. We want, you know, you know, we want so we set up alarms on our buildings and on our important places. We want financial security. So we you know, we put money into banks and we make investments because when we don't have security, we don't feel like we're in control. We're in control. We're exposed. We're unprotected and we're vulnerable. But there's a deeper level of vulnerability than just this physical vulnerability. And it's, it's emotional vulnerability. All right. And in this new relationship, which the children of Israel were forging with God, which after this year of uh, being with God at Mount Sinai, yeah, where does God, you know, where, where he, he takes us from Egypt and he's providing us everything, you know, that, that we have. And so where, where are we building this relationship from? God says this isn't going to work unless you're completely open to being in this relationship that I'm going to provide for you, but you must give up control. That's what God is asking. You have to let yourselves be vulnerable and you have to put your complete and utter trust and faith in me. So only take what you need for today, nothing more. And if you can trust me, I will never let you down. So when they complained back there in Shema, in Exodus, it wasn't only about the lack of food. And of course, they didn't actually want to go back to Egypt. At the heart of it, there was a fear of being vulnerable. In Egypt, it seems, and it's maybe contrary to what we talk about on Seder night, because we say that a slave doesn't know where his next meal is coming from, and that's one of the reasons why we do the afikomen. But the way the children of Israel are talking here, what it seems like, they had the food, they had the fish, they had the garlic, the watermelon, the leeks, or whatever it is. They had ability to be in charge of their own food somehow. But now, it's all up to God. And now, we come to Baha'u'llah. So we come to our Parsha this week. And this time, it's a year down the line. The children of Israel are no longer worried about starvation. They've seen that if they show faith in God, God rewards them. That they have food at their door or in the cupboard literally every single day. Because God will provide them. The only problem is, they're sick of the manna. Right? They're sick of it. I mean, I've, I've heard uh, sources why. One is that it was, it was a very spiritual food, although, as I said, it tasted maybe like uh, deep-fried bread with honey. Um, it didn't allow them to perform normal bodily functions. And I think they felt that they were missing out on being human by it. But there's something odd. Because right after they complain, the verses go into great detail about how the children of Israel prepare the manna. If you go to chapter 11, verse 8, it says, The people will go out and gather it, grind it between millstones, pound it in a mortar, boil it. You know, I mean, what's this talking about here? And, that, you know, that they, they, that they cook them into cakes. Well, well you know, it, it tasted like a rich cream. Okay, again, that doesn't sound very healthy. Okay, but what, what happened is the people, after all this time, they were trying to process the mana to put their own sort of stamp onto it. They were trying to take control. They say that the issue is a lack of food choice, but at its core, the people don't want to just rely on this spiritual bread. We don't want to be completely vulnerable to Hashem. It's precisely the same underlying issue that they had back in Shemot. And just like last time, it means something bigger. 
It means that God, we're not ready to be completely vulnerable to you. And now God is incredibly disappointed once again. Then they were scared about starving. They were vulnerable about that. Now they're vulnerable about what this food is for them. What does it mean? We want to do something with it. They wanted to make, they wanted to be part of the process of the preparation of the food. And with that, that process, they felt that they could take some sort of control. Right? And that's why God responds so harshly here. God responds because he says, I knew you were nervous to be completely vulnerable. I knew that you're upset to see all the control to me. And therefore, God says, I was patient. I provided for you. I gave you rules to ease you into it, to help you learn how to give up the control. Don't collect more than you need each day. Collect double on Friday. Do not collect any on Shabbat. You could rely on me. And when I gave you food for the first time, I told you that if you follow in my ways, if you trust in me, then the last source here, Exodus 15, 26, then if you listen to the Lord diligently, doing what is upright in his sight, giving ear to his commandments and keeping all those, then I will not bring upon you any of the diseases I brought about <laughs> For I, the Lord, am your healer. So God says that. And therefore, you know, you have to let yourself be vulnerable. And I will look after you. <clears throat> after all that, you still reject me. And therefore, in this week's parasha, that relationship breaks down. And the people are met with the very destruction that God warned them about. And that's why God was so angry with them. Because at the heart of the issue... Both of these stories are talking about the vulnerability of our relationship with God. And that's a challenge that we can certainly relate to because we try to control each detail of our lives. Everything we do, we try to control. But we also have to realize that sometimes we have to relinqu relinquish that control because when we're vulnerable, we're exposed and we can get hurt. But it's also only through vulnerability that we can build a close relationship with God. And only when we trust God to love us, to take care of us, that's the time when we can make that close relationship with God. And that's really what this message is about why, about why God got upset this time around. Last time, he understood the vulnerability and he gave them the food. This time, the vulnerability was beyond. They, they'd already shown that they were vulnerable. God's like, move on from that, but they won't. They want to be part of the process to take control. And now God's angry. I've shown you that I will look after you. I'll show you that I'll keep you. Now let me be the one to provide you with the food. And that was hard for the B'nai Israel. And as we said, the more things change, the more they stay the same. We find that hard. We find it sometimes to say, you know, it's all, it's all in the hands of God. Please, God, you know, we should, we should do something. Saying things like, please God, or Amir Tzah Hashem, are just subtle ways of recognizing that. I, I, mean, I, remember, I remember many years ago, I was, in, um, I was in Los Angeles, and Nami and I were there, and we were talking to a couple, and we were in their home, I think someone we knew was staying there, we'd gone around there, and they said, oh, what are you guys doing tomorrow? And I said to them, oh, please God, or Amir Tzah Hashem, tomorrow we're going to Universal Studios. And the couple left. And she, and she said, what do you mean, Emir Sashem, you're going to Universal Studios? Like, why are you bringing God into your trip to Universal Studios? As if it was, you know, almost blasphemous to say that. And I said, no. I said, I don't see a contradiction. Please, God, we're going to Universal Studios tomorrow. And God wants us to go. He'll help us and we'll get there. And if not, then we won't. Which, by the way, we did. But what I'm saying is that, that that's okay to recognize that our lives are in the hands of God. And that's why saying, please, God, and the is very much part of, of our parlance that we recognize that we're not always in control and that God very much is the one in control. And the B'nai Israel needed to learn that lesson twice with the mana. And that's what we're seeing here in this week's portion. And that's why God got angry with the children of Israel. Thank you all for listening. Um, I will see you all, please God, next week.